Well, you can see it is a very, very hot afternoon here at Juma. You can see this little male grey daker. He is uh, just taking a little bit of cover under one of the combretums, looking for some shade. Shame, and it's, you can see he's not moving anywhere. He is enjoying that shade yeah, around, of course, on a very, very hot afternoon. Of course, on uh, a Juma Private Game Reserve here in the world renowned Sabi Sands, South Africa. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cedric, and behind the camera with me here on Rusty, we've got Ghat. So, yes, thanks for joining us on our sunset safari. Nice just to have a good old start with one of these ant. Oh, <laughs> it's just gone. It just ran off. <laughs> <laughs> he decided to go. But of course, uh, yes, uh, joining us on uh, this afternoon's uh, drive, we've got uh, on Wendy, we're going to have old James and Panda. And, uh, Pride Lens, we're going to have Chris and Owen, and all the way down in the Eastern Cape, and Amakala, Steve, and Morgan. Apparently, there's a lot of wind at the moment in, uh, in the Eastern Cape, but I'm hoping that they will join us a little bit later. But yes, as you can see, it's a live and interactive show. So if you've got any comments, questions, suggestions that you want to send through, and if you are watching on the Wild Earth app or the website, make sure that you do register. It is very simple and easy. And you can send those comments and questions through to us on this beautiful Friday afternoon sunset safari. All right, but on that note, I think uh, let's uh, yeah, start heading. I'm actually looking to go over towards um, the area where we had uh, the young male leopard called Marips. We had him a little bit further down towards Spaghetti Crossing, Batalier Road. That's a little bit further south from where we are now. Maybe he's gone into the drainage line to take a little bit of shelter from the heat. Let's go and take a look and see if we are lucky with Marips. Very nice to have him this morning. And uh, it looked like he had something to eat. And I did, as I said, I did smell um, like stomach contents around that area. JC, it is a beautiful day. It is very hot. I mean, I think it's about 36, 36, 37 degrees Celsius at the moment here yeah, on uh, Juma. Um, not much wind, so of course there's no kind of, I can say, a wind that's going to cool the air down. It's just straight heat. But it's all right. I don't mind. I don't mind heat. I'd rather sit with a lot of heat than, uh, than a very cold drive and a rainy drive. So I do, me personally, I enjoy this. I really do enjoy this and um, you'll find that the water holes tend to become a little bit more active because a lot of the animals will go to down to watering holes to go and have a drink and a relax maybe in the water like buffaloes elephants things like that will go and enjoy a good old swim so but yeah let's go take a look first of all my reps if nothing um, I might end up going towards twin dams I know that old Jaminios He's going to head over towards Treehouse Dam, I think. But anyway, while we're going to continue that side, let's head over to the weather. Six degrees. That's quite hot. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Sunset Safari where it is just past lunchtime and very far away from sunset. My name is James Hendry. On camera today we have got Panda who has dispensed with his tracksuit pants. I'm eating a frozen banana. Mm. Which is an excellent substitute for ice cream if you don't have any. And you're trying to cool down your insides. Our plan this afternoon is going to be to drive from enormous tree to enormous tree. Hopefully enjoying the shades thereof. And that really is going to be my plan for the first half hour or so. I don't have any tracks to follow up on so I'll go from big tree to big tree, enjoy the shade and we'll talk about them. This is the famous Balanites Mogami or Torchwood. I've climbed this tree many times and were I not eating a frozen banana I'd probably climb it now. I will climb a few others I think during the course of the afternoon 
And this tree was made famous by the great Brent Leo Smith, erstwhile presenter at Wild Earth, who fell out of it during a live show. And I think he was quite lucky not to break his leg. Right. Small uh, wish list from Catherine today. She wants to see uh, dogs, art fark, uh, bush pigs, and marips. Uh, I'm afraid the chance of art fark very small on account of the fact that, well, nobody ever sees them. And we have sadly had to dispense with Amakala this afternoon, so we probably won't have bush pigs either. And the reason we've dispensed with Amakala this afternoon is that the wind is blowing so hard that Steve couldn't even keep his microphone on. Ooh. Ooh. Well, it's not that ooh. I spotted a bird up in the top of the tree. But it would appear to be just a yellow-fronted canary. I promise you, Sally Gray, you must try it. Somebody suggested I try it. I swore at them and then did try it. And I'll never look back. A frozen banana. It's the way to go. It has the sweetness of ice cream without the kind of nauseous feeling one might get post an ice cream. Especially if one eats as much of it as I do. And one feels like one is doing good for one's body as opposed to assaulting it with poisons. Right, well, I can't actually... St I can see a grey-headed sparrow up there as well, but that's about it. Everything is a bit listless in the heat of this day. No, oh, Jackie Darling, you want to see some ants today? Well, I shall try my level best to find you some ants, Jackie Darling. All right, Panda, let us move along from here. Thank you to all of you who are already commenting, no matter how you're doing it. Perhaps you're using the hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter or X. Perhaps you are chatting on YouTube. Perhaps you're sending questions through registering for free on our app or on our website. Any of those methods will work. And for the rest of you who are desperately trying to get hold of us, hashtag Wild Earth on the Tweet Tweet or the other methods that I just mentioned. Our next stop is going to be the Weeping Boerbean Tree, which is about a kilometre from here. Ah, Fab's vacation. You said Feline Friday would do it for you. Yes, it would do it for me too. Um, unfortunately, Cedric, as has been his wont over the last seven days or so, has not bothered to go and find me a cat to sit with for the entire afternoon. And he only sat with Maribs for about 40 minutes this morning, and so I felt bad going down there. Uh, and so I'm going to have to find something myself today if I want to have a feline Friday. We'll do our best. I keep forgetting it's Friday, of course. What we mustn't forget is that the Rugby World Cup is on and the first game of the day will start in about 15 minutes. Thankfully, it's not South Africa. They play at three o'clock on Sunday. Picky, you're still hoping that we're going to show you a yellow-billed kite, or YBK, one of the migrant birds. I wonder, I know, think you live up in Palaboa, and again, I'm sorry for that, but have you, have you seen one up there? They're not very common here in the low felt, but they're often one of the very first migrant birds that come back. And certainly, where my good wife uh, grew up in KwaZulu-Natal, uh, the yellow-billed kite is the first migrant that one looks for come the middle of August. But I haven't seen one here. I've seen Wahlberg's eaglies. I've heard a cuckoo or two. But otherwise, there hasn't been a great deal of 
migrant bird activity just yet in this part of the world. Yeah, we are really getting into the busyness end of the dry season now. Things are looking a little rough. Did you see my lightning quick reflexes there, Panda? Yeah. Did they remind you of Bruce Lee in his prime? I'm sure they did. Yoda. You, I thank. Not long ago, this pan was full and had a bit of water, but now you can see it all very thick all around that side. And you can see there's a beautiful quarry bush, it's right next to the pan. And sometimes I always try and look on the screen here just to see if maybe we see a flick of a tail somewhere in the grass. Butterflies, beautiful. And look what it is. 
Well, <laughs> as promised, I have come to another tree. This is the weeping boar bean tree that I spoke of. It's Shotia brachypatella or Scotia, depending on how you choose to pronounce it. And uh, well, it's a very good shady tree. I feel very shaded up here. I'm not sure how shaded Panda feels sitting in the full sun filming me up here, but I feel very shaded. It's taking a piece of Scotia out of my belly. Anyway, this tree will shortly produce its beautiful red flowers, which will uh, produce a lot of nectar, and that nectar will drip onto the ground, and that is why it is called a Scotia, or sh at least a weeping boar bean. It's not why it's called a Scotia. It was named after someone called Shot, I believe, and that's why it's called a Shotia. And interestingly, ah, in fact, I can actually see some flowers starting and I think Panda Bear may be able to get them. Let me try and climb a bit higher. If I do fall down, I'm sorry for the trauma that it will cause all of you to see me plummet to the floor, <coughs> probably maiming myself permanently. <coughs> Panda is quivering with nervousness. Panda, can you see can you hear me? Can you see over here? There's a, I'm trying to get a stick to point with. Fortunately, the tree is not giving one up. Just up there, I'll try and go even higher. There we go. Right, here it is. Can you see that, Panda? That is the beginning of some flowers. Those are the flower buds. And they will make those beautiful red flowers. Now, also important to note is the fact that when our, some of our erstwhile ancestors came tax evading up from the Cape on the Great Trek, they brought with them some sort of, some pieces of Western culture, if you like, uh, one of which was coffee. And the locals out here, they didn't make coffee, they didn't drink coffee, they didn't have a substitute for coffee at the time. And so what they, the Boers did was that they used to take the beans of this tree, grind the, them up, roast them, and make a coffee substitute. Now, I think it's worth noting that when these people departed the Cape Colony circa 18... When did it start? Uh, I think it started around about 1830-odd, maybe even before that. Yeah, let's call it between 1820 and 1830. The further they got from the Cape Colony, obviously, the further they got from things like imported goods coffee being one of those and so they had to make these substitutes and I don't think it's any great surprise that none of those have survived as a sort of South African speciality with one noticeable uh, exception and one that I make note of quite frequently and that is the rusk. The rusk which in any other part of the world would be considered some sort of starvation or wartime ration here is a delicacy. Stale, sweet bread, basically. That is all I have to say about this tree. Becky, see you say the elusive Henry. Not very elusive. I uh, just, I suppose, um, I'm not sure actually. Not very elusive when I am live, shall we say that. Quite easy to see, despite my small stature. I am now going to attempt to climb down from this tree. And, uh, well, Again, I apologize if I fall, causing anybody a trauma that they will never forget. I may need to get Panda to come and fetch me, because unfortunately, when I climbed up the tree, I actually used the vehicle to do so, which uh, might be necessitated again. 
Now, Tadiwa, who is directing the show, has clearly not done this before with me because normally what the director would do... Ah, there we go. Fantastic. She's done it. <laughs> this is our ancestral weekend, or our celebration of ancestors weekend. And so, while I plummet from this tree, you're going to go and have a look at one of our very favorite ancestors in the Inkuhuma Pride. <laughs> My dear, he's not interested. She's not interested. Leave me alone. So we can't see them, but maybe they'll move closer towards the adults in a bit. This is very, very exciting, everyone. Oh my goodness. One. says she's quite a polite individual. She moved off towards our left-hand side to do her ablutions, and the five hyena took that as an opportunity to, to get up, raise the tails, and come in en masse. And the second lioness chased them away, full of aggression. She moved straight at them. So I'm still in uh, search of uh, Marips, that young male leopard, and um, of course I'm off the vehicle at the moment. Just taking a look at every little corner of this area, all the little shady spots. Um, I walked into the drainage line, it seems like they are bumped into three hyenas that were passed out inside the drainage line. So the hyenas are still around. I'm sure, because it looks like they might have scared him off there and he came into this area, yeah. So I might go back into the Mawati and go take a look along the drainage line just to see if we're going to be lucky that side. But yes, I've got my weapon of choice. A little stick. So in case uh, he has to come for me, I'll just like, no, no, no. Near. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I don't think that'll help. I won't just do that. I think I'll throw it at him. Um, but yes, that's... So I'm just going to take... Ooh. <laughs> Do you love relaxing at a waterhole with the sights and sounds of Africa all around you? Well, we have some really exciting news for you. From August 1st, Africam is joining forces with Wild Earth to bring the majesty of Africa right into your living room with nine incredible new waterhole cameras from across South Africa and Kenya. Get ready to embark on a new journey. This is Live at the Waterhole.
All right, let me just make my way out from here. As I say, I'm now muddied up. It really looked dry. So it just shows you, it can be so deceiving. Dry mud, it looks dry. Next moment, you sink. You sink. And I stink. You sink, then you stink. Mmm, lovely. All right. On. Those poor hyenas bolted her. They, they didn't know what hit them when they saw me in the drainage line. All right, let's go this side. <laughs> uh, no, nah. oh, but it's all good fun. Always, it's all, always good fun. It's, you just got to take it, take it as it comes. Let's take a look here. Drainage line maybe might be lying here somewhere. In a tree, maybe in this cool drainage line. If not, we're going to head to Twin Dams. Oh, hello. Here's the next tree. Now, this is an appropriate tree for this weekend because it is ancestor weekend and uh, well this particular tree saw one of our very favorite ancestors in it a number of times uh, the very famous Kurula the leopardess used to spend time in this tree and that's quite interesting because it was very far on the western edge of her territory and while she used to spend time here, so did her daughter Shadow, latterly Tundi. Tundi very seldom came this far over to the world, towards the west, though. She normally stayed a bit further east. And I've seen... Who else have I seen in here? I think I've only seen Karula in this tree, actually. And it's a low-felt milkberry, or Manalkara Mochisa, which I've always quite liked as a name. And it produces a fruit that has quite a lot of milky latex in it. I'm told it's quite sweet, or I've read that it's quite sweet and quite nice. I've tried to eat them and I've, I'm really not a huge fan. And I have heard of people eating them and having, shall we say, loose bowels for some time afterwards. So I wouldn't recommend eating the fruits of Manalcara Mochisa or the low-felt milkberry. As you can see, it is a wonderful shade tree and it often grows on a termite mound. Beautiful. It's always reminded me sort of of a, of a sort of, the kind of tree you might read about in a Tolkien novel. You know, it's got a sort of hobbitesque or fairy-esque quality to it. I think. Uh, you might think I'm talking utter garbage, which is your prerogative, and that's absolutely fine. And I think the last time I saw Karula here, it was when her two cubs, her final two cubs, Hosanna and Shongile, were still tiny little babies. And I remember trying to see them around here and they went scarpering off into the bush. Uh, Sunrise Susie, I think your name is, you said you hope the leopard doesn't climb the tree while I'm here. Well, if the leopard does climb the tree while I'm here, uh, I think I've either gone blind or I'm probably uh, not going to make it down. Ah, Sunrise 7, not Sunrise Susie. Good. Well, that was Manalkara Mochisa, the Lofelt Milk Berry. Delicious. I shall now climb out of this tree. I can see, I can actually see, quite interestingly, some places where cats have climbed up here. You can see where the bark has been torn away and by some sharp, some sharp implements, namely claws. And so I think this is probably relatively frequently used by the likes of Shidulu. She would be one who used this tree and possibly Tortoise Pan. They would be the two leopards that used this tree. It's right sort of on the border. It's right on the border between two territories. 
that's interesting. This is an old cigarette box and I don't think it was left here by an ancient ancestor. I wonder when it was left here. I suspect, given the brand, that it was left here sometime during lockdown. That's very interesting indeed. Max, you say, nice climb, James, brings you back to your younger days. I'm glad it does. We're just going to do a little bit of investigating around here. The other thing that there is, is orange peel. Now, either this has been discarded by a trespasser, or I actually think much more likely, it's probably been a favorite resting spot for an anti-poaching unit that comes along here, probably sits up on the termite mound, uses it as a vantage, has the odd orange, and then rather inconsiderately tosses their orange pips or orange peels. I suspect that's what it is. Anyway, very interesting. Okay, that was Manalcara Mochisa. Now we've got to get out of here. The route I came in on was uh, very thick with bushes. We'll try and make it out along a slightly easier path. Right, Sedas has unfortunately not managed to find Marite, but he has managed to find the wigs. Okay, James. I left the area now where we had Marips this morning. And um, no luck there, but it's a bit hot now, so I think I'll wait for it just to cool down a little bit and then go try again a little bit later on to see if we are lucky, we're going to get lucky with uh, that young male leopard. But for now, we have got one of the spotted eagle owls, one of the wigs that's sitting on the nest. So yesterday was the first time that we really saw um, this female uh, sitting on the nest here yeah, in the drainage line. And I got information as well last night that uh, last year, the first time we saw the wigs on the nest last year was on the 9th of September. So if we saw it yesterday, yesterday was the 14th. So it just shows you a few days out, a few days out. Um, so this is clearly the time when they will start uh, nesting and start to having little eggs. I'm sure she's going to maybe have one or two in the clutch again. Last year she had two. So I guess time will tell. If she's not here then we can at least see. Maybe we'll be able to see the eggs. But for now she is just really incubating them and keeping cool. Yeah. Oh, hello. Oh, they even winked at us. Keeping cool on this hot summer's day. So there's a few flies and funny things that's flying around my head here. Yeah. And how nice is this to see? I can't see the male. Usually the male will be also very close by. He might be in one of the trees around here. I'm just keeping an eye on her, making sure that she's safe as well, that he will, at night time, he'll go out and go and look for something to catch, some rodents, and then bring it back to her while she sits on the nest and or sits on the eggs to incubate them. Rodney, yes, I think we all can't wait for the chicks. I'm hoping that she's going to be successful again like last year. She had all the two of them. They had the two chicks and uh, looks like most of both of them got to adulthood and they took, took flight from the nest around about the beginning of January. So let's see if we're going to get that success again this year. it would be fantastic. As you know, we don't sit too long with her because we do, you know, I don't like... Uh, really putting too much pressure on these spotted eagle owls, especially when she's sitting on the eggs, if there's eggs. 
So I'm just going to do a little bit of a short segment here and then I am going to move on. And of course, if the male isn't successful in getting food during the night time, you'll find the female will also leave uh, the nest and she'll also go and try and search for something to go and feed on. Uh, of course, primarily some rodents. And so well camouflaged in this bank on the side of the Moati, very well camouflaged. Sorry, right, girl. We are going to leave very shortly, don't worry. I'll give her some time. Lindsay, well, they'll, they'll protect it, you know, if, they, if, uh, if, you, if, if you come towards uh, the chicks or there's, uh, the eggs are there and you out the vehicle and come, coming to take a look at them and these two uh, spotted eagle owls so yeah, then they're going to dive bomb you, they're going to come, talents and all, you know, they're going to protect. So yes, with those big talents of theirs and as well, as you can see, very well camouflaged, very, very well camouflaged. So, for something to drive past here or to walk by here to see these uh, the, the spotted eagle out on the nest, uh, it is going to be very tough. You're going to really have an uh, uh, an eagle owl eyesight there to spot that. All right, but we're going to move on. All right, well we're going to move on and all that. Let's head over to James to see what's happening on his safari. Well, I am searching for my next shady tree. My next shady tree will probably be the jackalberry tree. And the jackalberry tree is known by a number of names. The other one is the ebony tree or African ebony. And I've always quite liked the Latin name because it's got a nice ring to it, but it's the kind It does look a little bit on the tired side, doesn't it? His eyes look very, very exhausted. Oh my goodness. Oxpack, you're almost the size of that in Bala's head. Be gentle. Just be slow, still learning. Here we go. Getting another spot that the Impala can't often reach, right near where the horns is just starting to push out. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, it's a little one. It's a juvenile. And it's also joining the party, waiting for somebody to feed it. Yes, flap your feathers. Oh, shame. <laughs> I can't get rid of them. <laughs> Look at them, they're having an argument. No, you leave me alone. I said, don't go there. Shame, little one. You might have to buck and rear to be able to get those birds off. Holding on nice and tight to your fluffy fur. Sorry about losing James there, we might actually lose us as well, but let's see. Uh, I think James is in a bad signal spot, we're in a bad signal spot here at the moment in the Mulwati, but let's see, hopefully, hopefully the signal sticks here. I might have a bit of scratchy here at the moment, but that's fine. Let's see if we can get out here. So I'm on my, making my way towards uh, Twin Dams, I've left uh, the wigs, as I said I don't like spending too much time there. and. Um, leave her in peace all right let's see if we can get around this tree yep all right it's a little bit cooler in the drainage line Oh, it's nice to spin some. 
Sorry, Tadiba, I did not copy that question at all. Uh, Heather, the way to keep safe while on foot is just to be vigilant, really vigilant on your surroundings and what you're doing. Um, take the earpiece out so <clears throat> you don't uh, have any other noises. So you can listen out for the animals if something is busy giving you a warning call or a growl or something, then you can at least pick up on that. Um, and, uh, well, sometimes I'll take a stick. So sometimes the stick just helps, you know, in case I have to, you know, throw the stick at cover some... Your shoes in mud. <laughs> and cover your shoes in mud, that's another one. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's just got to be vigilant. I think it's every person's got a different way of dealing with it. But I, I always say, make sure you know your surroundings. Don't put yourself into those situations, or don't get yourself into those situations. Oh, there's a little... He's slender, but he's darted off now. Uh, he's gone. Uh, a little slender mongoose that's just run off now. But some uh, green voodoo poos. And starlings. I don't want to see which one we've got first here. Yeah. Oh, right above us. Oh, there he goes. Ah, it's gone. lost us earlier. I don't know why you lost us earlier. In fact, I suspect no one does. I feel rather like a baboon right now because oft times have I seen a baboon standing in a tree like this going... <coughs> 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 
especially a young male who might want to be showing how intimidating he is. I apologize for the wind noise, but I shall continue my story. I wasn't going to stop at a tree before I hit a jackalberry, but then I saw this one. And this is Gardenia falkensii, or the Transvaal Gardenia, or the Folks Gardenia, as I think it's called now. And it's not a particularly beautiful tree structurally, I don't think, but I do think that it makes the best smelling flower out here. And unfortunately, I'm unable to bring you a flower to smell because you are on the other side of the interweb or the television, and it makes it very difficult to explain. But I think, you know, the closest smell I can get to uh, to describe it would be, it's just, it's like a really sweet floral smell. And I suspect that there are, I wonder if there are other gardenia species that smell similar, I'm not sure. But it's a lovely sweet sort of almost jasmine-y, a bit sweeter than jasmine probably, and not quite as, not quite as uh, herbaceous as jasmine, but just really sweet and delicious and I think it's the nicest smell out here. I did promise Panda I would bring him a flower to smell. And what's interesting is that once they get to this sort of stage here, they stop smelling. And even this one that I'm going to pick will have be losing its smell already. Lons, you want to know if this tree will be used by birds to make a nest? Yeah, they'll definitely use twigs from this tree to make a nest. And then I'm just going to get a piece cultural things that people use it for out here. Okay, so here's the flower, and they only really smell strong for about, I'd say maybe a day and a half or two days, when the flowers are white. As soon as they start turning yellow, they lose their smell. This one you can still subtly smell. Panda, there you are. Let's see what he says. What do you think, Panda? He's, he's enjoying the experience. He's shut his eyes to smell it. Nice, hey? Thank you, Forest Monarch. You say the award for the most sure-footed guide goes to me. That's just because I haven't fallen out of a tree publicly. All right, um, this all, tree's also known as the Mercedes-Benz tree, and you can see sort of why there. All right, you got it? Okay. All right, and so what we have there is the three-pointed star, and often these ones are a bit longer, so it's more obviously three-pointed. And it is used traditionally in homes out here by local people, and you put a piece of this tree upright like that at the, each corner of your property, and that will ward off evil spirits. I don't know if it works, I haven't tried it myself, but I don't have a huge experience of evil spirits, as far as I'm aware. I might be inundated with them, but uh, as far as I'm aware, I'm not. Uh, it's just quite a nice cultural belief around this tree, and it's because of the way it grows in the Mercedes-Benz shape. Okay, that is the Transvaal Gardenia, a very acceptable shade tree, especially when growing on a termite mound where there is a comfortable dirt sofa to sit upon. Now we will find a jackalberry down at the base of this road. There we go. We are moving now. So we've had the torchwood, the weeping boar bean, and the uh, low-filled milkberry, and now the gardenia. Jackie darling, you say that you've never seen a gardenia that big? Yes, it is a big one. They do get very big out here. I think that one is probably so big because it's growing upon a termite mound, which means that the nutrition 
that it uh, has. That is the most beautiful jackalberry tree in here. I'm just going to do a little foray off the road and I'm going to do it because this jackalberry also has some ancestral meaning to it. I'm not sure I'll be able to get up into it, but I'm going to try. So this is the jackalberry, Diaspirus mespeloformes, or as some guides like to say, Diaspirus mespeloformes. And it's a particularly, it's almost a bonsai, semi-bonsai version of the tree. And this particular example of it, I remember being played in by Hosanna and Shongile, the two leopards belonging to the late Queen Kurula. This could be embarrassing. Yeah. I'm not going to show you what my right hamstring looks like now. Just letting the pain go from about a 9 out of 10 to a 7 before I continue speaking. Okay. Anyway, those two wonderful little leopard cubs used to play in this tree and we had some wonderful, wonderful times watching them leap up and down. They were born on the 2nd of February 2016 and we watched them well until Hosanna left when he was about four and Shongila sadly disappeared about, she was about 16 months old. Right, good news is that we have got Chris at Pridelands. The load shedding is over there and he would like to say hello to you. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and it is a nice and hot day here at Eco Training and we are operating on the Pridelands Conservancy and we have a giraffe to start off with and we are in the shade which is very important because it's very hot and the sun is dangerously uh, 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 spiky today. My name is Chris and with me there behind the camera is Owen Dell, OD, OD as we all know, know him. Anyway, giraffe, that's what we're gonna watch for now and just the water roll in general. See what comes around, perhaps we're lucky with some elephants and then we'll, we'll reassess from there but for the next 20-30 minutes we're gonna be right here in the shade at the water roll and see what presents itself. Maybe some birds, as I said, elephants. Then we have the giraffe. And they are just milling around. They, they've had a drink already. And now they're just sort of like moving around. Here's another one in the distance. eating uh, some form of a small tree there. Looks like it might be even be... Oh, I can't see what it is. Actually, it's too far. It's a green tree. Must say there's a little bit of a breeze and I think without that breeze it would have been a lot hotter than it is at the moment and I think the big one is tomorrow the big one's coming tomorrow today it's like a, a nice hot day hi there Ray asking what antics am I gonna have for them today am I gonna climb any trees hi there Ray now I am I'm a bit of a conservative guy in that respect 
when it comes to that i am a i'm a naturalist i'm a professional guide so i'm going to stick to that for now and i'm horrible at climbing trees anyway i i'm not very good at that so no i'm not i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna do safari how about that that's my antics that i'm gonna do because i can do safari a lot better than i can climb trees i used to climb trees when i was a young boy and in my early adulthood, but I, I struggle with it now. Maybe I'm a little bit obese. <laughs> That's perhaps why. Between the lines. Anyway. <laughs> no, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on, on Safari. That's all tongue in cheek. Discover the wonders of the wild with Safari Snaps, Africam's fun community game. While enjoying the live streams, simply tag the animal you spot. Each tag earns you points based on the rarity of the species. The rarer, the more points you score. Your profile and the Safari Snaps leaderboard will keep track of your impressive tagging skills. Join us on Safari Snaps and let's celebrate the wonders of African wildlife together. Gone. There we go. Behind the thorn tree. <laughs> yeah, that's how it goes. Now there's nothing. Now we just sit and watch the water roll. So yeah, it, uh, it's uh, coming back to temperature, to give an idea, it's about 37 degrees today. That's hot, any day. 
currently it's 37 degrees. Thank you, Chris. Well, one from one giraffe to the next one. And here we are, sitting with a beautiful male giraffe here on the southern side of uh, Juma. And you can see this boy is quite a stunning male, nice and tall, and getting to those nice, fresh little leaves on top. So very fortunate for giraffe. Of course, things, the other browsers, they will feed lower, to, closer to the base of the tree where the giraffe being so tall, a good five and a half meters, this male can really get to those nice little shoots or the last few leaves that's remaining on these trees. And looks like he's had enough of that one. He might just, uh, no, I think he's seen some more fresh leaves around the corner. Ooh, there's a nice one. Is he going to get, the, yep, there it is. He's got some nice ones there. And he's using that beautiful long tongue really wrapping around those branches and stripping all those leaves off and make it look so so delicious and of course and that's what primarily their diet consists of leaves so many times they will enjoy things like more the thorny trees you're looking at buffalo thorn knob thorn black monkey thorn Things like that, sweet thorn, mm, they love those leaves, very palatable. No, see, giraffes do not hum. I've never heard a giraffe humming. So, so giraffes are very silent unless they're sneezing. I've never heard a giraffe make any noises than a sneeze. Apparently they do make a noise. Uh, Lauren said, so I think Lauren was talking about some noises, but uh, I've never heard a giraffe make a noise in my entire life. So humming, hmm. maybe it's the camera that's humming at the moment, I'm not too sure. <laughs> but uh, clearly it's not this giraffe. It'll be interesting to see giraffes hum. Imagine all of them standing together and all humming. The pitch is too high. So Gert says the pitch is too high. <laughs> so they can't get to that pitch. <laughs> oh, that is a funny for the day. <laughs> um, what are you looking at, Mr. Giraffe? Um, <laughs> he's like, mm, no. But you also see now you've got those two ossicones right on top of its head. That's the horns. And then you've got like a little bump on the center part and as well as at the back. It's like calcification protrusion, so it's like really calcified bones. So it really makes like a very hard section on the skull. And what happens is if male giraffe have to start necking, in other words, if they have to start challenging one another for f mating rights for a female that's in heat, what happens if, if you've got a bigger head, in other words, if you've got a bonier head and a heavier head, um, of course, the blow to the other giraffe is going to be much, much harder. And uh, so that's why these males will get those real calcific calcification protrusions on the head. If you look at a female, they don't have any of those bumps. They've got the ossicones, the two horns, much thinner, but they don't have those two bumps, the one in front and the one at the back of the ossicones. So, oh, look at that tongue. <laughs> I love when they try and reach. They're reaching for that, f that far, far one, that far leaf. Oh. He is loving it, really enjoying it. It looks like a no, I almost thought it might have been a tree wisteria, but it's not. Fantastic eyesight, he has very big eyes. Rock candy Susie, you say giraffes moo. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Um, all right. So if they do moo, 
Uh, it'll be interesting, yeah. Well, I did not know that. Hmm. They're very silent animals. It's more to do with body language. So if they do see a predator, it's no alarm calling. So if they see a predator, what happens in parlors, monkeys, or whatever is around the area with the giraffe, they'll see the giraffe's posture and staring at something, and just that body language will kind of tell them, listen, but there is something here, watch out, take a look. There might be danger. But yes. All right, so humming and mooing. Interesting ones coming through here. Jenna from the UK. Yes, they do know. They know exactly which ones is going to have the nice leaves on them, uh, nice palatable leaves. So they know. Um, they can pick up on that very quickly. Um, you'll find many times, if you actually follow a giraffe and there's a, like a few uh, buffalo thorns in the area, you'll find that that giraffe will go from one buffalo thorn straight to the next one, straight to the next one, because they know it's a very palatable leaf and uh, they can pick up on that very uh, quickly. Like, just like this uh, giraffe now. I'm trying to see exactly uh, the tree. It's not that it was... Oh, well, I don't even know. I'm lost with the tree here. Uh. Oh, it's got big pods on it. It's one of the bush willows, and there's pods right on top, the four wing pods. It's a typical coming from the Combretum family. So, I was looking for the next one. Next succulent tree. All right, well, we are going to continue with our drive. I'm not, not too sure exactly which waterhole James is sitting at at the moment, but uh, let's go to James and see what's happening there on the east side. Well, apparently these beefies have hardly moved during the course of the day. This is where they were left this morning. We came down towards Treehouse Waterhole, and here we have arrived at the same time as this rather large herd of buffaloes. Interesting little colour palette here as they come down, and interesting sounds too. Let's go with the sounds first. There's the sound of wind, obviously. There's a northwest wind blowing, which is what happens on these hot days. You can hear that. Very little by way of bird song. There are 7,000 flies trying to carry me out of this vehicle and take me somewhere else, so you can probably hear those. And then, very little by way of bird song yet. Oh, that was a brown snake eagle taking off. And then just in amongst the sort of breezy noise, you can hear the odd buffalo low. Wow. It is very blowy. And then from a color perspective, really kind of typical color palette for this time of year with the brown soil, slightly darker brown, leafless trees, and then, quite specially, you can just see the little green buds of the new Combretum leaves coming through. And it just adds a little splash of welcome color to an otherwise fairly drab scene, I would say. Let us not forget the rich, 
dark blue black of the buffalo as well. <laughs> Hello Zandile, you say how come we never see the buffalo weavers following buffalo? Well Zandile it's because buffalo weavers don't eat, or I mean they don't normally follow herds of animals. They are largely seed-eating birds actually so they don't eat insects that might be kicked up out of the grass or disturbed by the buffalo's hoofs. So they, yeah, they're, they're largely seed eaters. They will definitely eat some insects, but largely seed eaters. And they're called buffalo weavers. Why are they called buffalo weavers? I think because of their color and maybe their size. You know, they're pretty big. Oh my girl, you go. Come on, girl. Come on, girl. You're doing so well. Come on, girl, you're doing so well. There she goes again. She made it on all fours. <laughs> right. Uh, it is not really cooling down at the moment. It's comfortable where we are in the shade. But uh, out there it's still hot. I was hoping to get more birds. There's just one lone, what's that, a starling. That, uh, oh, there's a three banded plover. Okay, we got some birds.
and see what comes out. One thing I'm waiting for for this uh, weeping boer bean to start flowering and it's around about the time where it will. Um, Those little red flowers that they produce attract a wide variety of birds because they're quite rich in nectar. A very syrupy, sweet nectar in those flowers. In fact, it drips from the flowers. Hence the name Weeping Bourbon. Patiently waiting. What have we got there? Oh, that's another starting. No, it's a thick knee. What's that? It's a thick. Uh, it looks like a thick knee. Water thick knee. Um. So that's the water thickney. It used to be called a water dekop. Dekop being an Afrikaans name meaning thick head. Now called thick knees. It's one of the birds here who's changed their name to the more internationally used family name for these birds. Samantha wants a dam like this for this heat. The only problem is, Samantha, there might be crocodiles in there. That's the only thing. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have been in there to cool down. I wouldn't do it live, but maybe behind the scenes. No, it doesn't seem like this much now. The from the UK wants to know of that giraffe that had the injured face or practically non-existent face ever been seen or heard of again. Um, unfortunately, I've had no reports since that day. It, it was seen the day thereafter, uh, also close to where I initially witnessed it and I have not received any further reports of that animal. So I cannot conclude if it's still alive or not. I don't actually know. But my personal feel that it's it's very likely expired, died. In all likeliness. That injury is just too severe. The infection there is too severe, and I, I, I doubt whether that animal would have been able to overcome that. That is my personal feeling, but again, I cannot conclude it. Right, seems like James also made his way to a water hole, and there might be some action there. So let's quickly head over to Juma with James. I'm sorry that you lost us. I'm not sure what happened. The feeds out of Juma have been a little bit unstable in the last couple of days. Anyway, we didn't miss a great deal, but now our buffalo are making their way slowly down towards the water. I'm not sure why I said the water like that. Seems a bit strange. Quite a decent sized herd. I'd say at least 150 or so buffaloes. I don't know why they're not thirstier. Maybe this is the third or fourth time they've come down during the course of the day. 
or maybe they're just feeling quite listless after an afternoon sleep. You know, after you've had a little afternoon lie down and you wake up and you feel, well, a lot worse than you did when you went to sleep. I wonder if that's not how these buffalo feel now. Certainly if I have a little afternoon lie down for anything longer than 15 minutes, I feel like I've been in a coma for years. Hello Lynn, apparently you said the following. Yay! Buffalo! Uh, yes, quite. I mean, I like buffalo on a live drive. I like them when they're at the water hole. But I have to tell you, I'm not whipping my camera out to take any pictures. It's difficult to take a good picture of a buffalo. Because although they're pretty impressive in real life, and probably much more so on video, when you take a still photograph of them, unless you've got them kind of covered and dripping in mud or with an ox pecker halfway up their noses, they tend to look just like cattle, really. But this is a magnificent scene with this huge herd coming down to drink. On Woodbury Lodge's episode of Destination Safari. I'm so used to views, I forget to mention it sometimes. <laughs> Underfloor heating in the bathrooms, air conditioning, all those luxury items. Dinner is a full three-course meal, um, starter, main, and dessert. Early morning drive, and on that drive, you might see some slightly different things, some rare things. You know. Destination Safari, bringing luxury safari travel to the world. Hello, my name is Maurice. I am from Perth in Western Australia. Hello, I'm Stéphane. As you can hear, I am French and I'm doing the 35 days uh, online course. I started watching Wild Earth during COVID. I decided that I wanted to study more. And in order to do that, I saw that Eco Training Pridelands um, was doing courses and I decided to do the eight-week online theory course 
at the end of last year. So the 35 days course basically starts with the theory online, uh, three sessions a week, very enjoyable. We went really, really deep into it, uh, very holistic as well. I uh, really enjoyed it. It goes from insects to stars to obviously your mammals and your birds. I liked the, the two components. Uh, it just got me really well prepared before I got here. Despite my accents and my misunderstandings, Everyone has been very helpful and uh, comprehensive to help me to understand everything. Whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out on your journey towards becoming a conservationist, our digital courses offer a flexible and accessible way to deepen your knowledge and understanding of the natural world. So why wait? Sign up for an eco-training digital course today. Start your journey towards a more sustainable and connected future today. Righty, and we're still here with our buffaloes. We're not at eco-training, we're at Juma. Eco-training is about 50 kilometers towards the northwest, in case you're wondering. Wonderful spot. They're all slowly making their way down. Ooh. Ooh. Look. Look at this, what young panda has discovered. It is a little family of water pigs and they are very shy. They have realized that they are on camera and their mother has said to them, you know what guys, I just, I, I haven't signed a released form for this. I don't know what they're going to use the images for. Let's just come back later. <laughs> I suppose the other thing to say about this particular sighting is that it's a nice illustration of the kind of landscape that a mega herbivore like this buffalo can survive on. And although it looks like there's almost nothing left there to eat but for very dry grass, these buffalo have a tremendous digestive system. And as long as they can get enough water, they can digest and find enough nutrition in the driest, most seemingly hopeless vegetation, and that's what they're doing. You can hear them. Uh, Riley, the only animals that can submerge in water, elephants and buffalo. Uh, no, I've actually, I can't think that I've seen a buffalo fully submerge itself. And maybe they have. I, I can't remember seeing that. Hippos, obviously. I'm, sh I'm assuming you mean mammals, not just animals. And by mammals, you mean land-based mammals as opposed to the mammals that live in the sea, which are clearly always submerged unless they're leaping out the water. Uh, other animals that might submerge themselves, leopards sometimes, lions unusually I think, but they could. You know, if they really want to go and fetch something, hyenas will definitely, I mean they will put stuff, they'll hide stuff in water and then put their heads right under the water in order to get it. I'm just trying to think of any other mammals out here that might submerge themselves completely in water. I don't think any of the antelope would. Rhino, I haven't seen do it. They'll just go into mud. Um, yeah, Plus, oh, those are them. Elephants and hippos mainly, uh, maybe the odd cat. And that's probably about it. I really don't know why there are so many flies, unless they've been breeding in this quarry bush. Maybe that's what it is. But we are being savaged by them, Panda and I. <laughs> Remember, we'd love to hear from you, hashtag wild earth on the tweet tweet. It's always good to have your questions and comments and 
general banter around our safaris. Questions, comments, general banter. Sorry, you're going to have to go again to that, Tadiwa. I, I didn't get it. Tadiwa is uh, directing the show today. What do I think of the European buffalo compared to the African one? Um... I can't think that I've ever given it a second thought. Um, are you asking the differences? The European buffalo, I think, is very much like the Asian one, and so imminently more domesticatable than this. Looks fairly similar. I mean, you can definitely see it's a buffalo. They don't have the same boss on the head. They're slightly grayer color than these very black, rich, richly black ones. That's all I can really tell you about them. I've seen them in India. Uh, I might be a slightly different species in Europe. I've never seen a Euro European buffalo. And now I'm even more confused. You want to know what I think about the extinct European buffalo compared to the African one. I'm afraid I'm going to have to give that some thought. You mean the European bison, maybe? Yes, Cindy D, that's what I was hoping for. I was rather hoping that some elephants would come down, but I think, you know, as happens from time to time out here, the elephants have sort of moved on. And they'll come back, obviously, and they'll probably come back fairly soon. But, I, I, yeah, I think that they've probably moved on for a little while. And I say that because we haven't seen one today. And over the last few days, you know, you couldn't drive more than, I don't know, five minutes or so without seeing an elephant. So they may have moved off the reserve for a little while and they'll allow it to rejuvenate in various ways and then they'll come back. But yes, elephants in the water on a hot day like this, just the best. I mean, it's what you hope for when you go out on drive. Even with real guests as opposed to virtual ones, it's always really nice to go out on a hot day like this arrive at a waterhole and find a whole herd of elephants having a swim or a drink or a mud bath. It's always just peaceful and picturesque and almost universally fascinating to everyone. Bit of a breeze still blowing. All right, let's go across to Cedars. We're not gonna move from here for now. We'll wait for it to cool down a bit before we head off. Uh, and Cedars, I think, is driving around as we speak. Nice jams, nice having the turtle the jam. Uh, okay, so what I've done, 
I've turned around and twin I've come back to the area where we had that young male leopard this morning, my rips. Um, I'm just trying to see if I can pick up on any other tracks. So I went all the way up uh, the road where we found him this morning, Batalia Road. And I'm coming all the way down back into this drainage line because when I did take a walk earlier, I uh, bumped into three uh, hyenas that are still lying in the drainage line. Well, why will they be in there for the entire day? So I think I still want to try and scout the area just to see if uh, there's any potential predator around yeah so i'm gonna go do new island north, uh, south now i'm just gonna go down this way and see what we can find but the day is slowly but surely cooling down it's uh temperature has dropped a bit still quite warm but at least the temperature has dropped a bit so it's getting a little bit more pleasant now um, let's see let's see let's see Three hyenas and one marips uh, makes uh, sandy. I don't want to get the last bit there. Um, <laughs> that's all I heard. So if you can just go with that last. Bit. Three hyenas and a marips makes a. Uh, oh, makes oh, makes you nervous, Sandy. Three hyenas and a marips. Yeah, it is. Uh, no, nah, not really, actually. With hyenas, like those three. <laughs> the funniest part about this now, so when. Well, I feel a bit bad about this because I did not know that the hyenas were there. But uh, when I walked towards the drainage line looking for marips when I was on foot, before I got my shoe all muddied up, I walked towards the drainage line and I saw one hyena flat uh, passed out, like there in the drainage line, like passed out i even rustled my shoes and like the leaves and that and <clears throat> did that not a wink nothing i thought then i then i realized i was like thinking but maybe is this hyena dead i'm like i got a little bit worried there and then of course i went like Meow! as soon as i did that <laughs> chaos just erupted uh, then i uh, jumped up and then and then the other two came out as well from their hiding spot and they just bolted down the, the, the drainage line and uh, uh out of sight so yeah <laughs> but that hyena was passed out i feel so bad i, I mean I, I thought that hyena might have been dead you know i thought okay there's something wrong here because it hasn't been picked up on my movements coming through the grass anyway just shows you sometimes these hyenas if they want to sleep they can sleep oh, deep sleep there deep sleep hmm you would think that would have heard me long time ago clearly not all right that's uh, coming up to the area where the hyenas ran into they ran into this area as well so i'm just gonna keep my eyes peeled here let's see if we're gonna get any a lucky break with uh, something in the area to touch the lives of future protectors of our earth? Thanks to our wonderful Wild Earth explorers, Wild Earth Kids is back. Sign your class up for Wild Earth Schools and enjoy a special virtual field trip to Africa with interactive learning tailored for kids. Very warm welcome to the kids from Ludworth Primary School. We'll be dedicating the first hour of Sunset Safaris every Wednesday to our planet's future defenders. Wild Earth, it's in your nature.
who've just rejoined us. There go the buffalo. They're heading off towards the northeast. And I'm pretty sure they'll go straight back up onto that sort of ridge line area where they've spent most of the day. And they'll have another feed of very dry and apparently unpalatable and nutrition-free grass. But it will sustain them. And there is a lot of that kind of grass around after the heavy rainy season we had last year. And that means animals like buffalo are going to thrive because there's still quite a lot of water around. It hasn't dried out like it would on most years because last year was a very heavy rain year. And so they're all doing fine. Donna, Donna V, uh, Donna Vigiani, all the way from Toronto, Canada, sorry. Um, <laughs> I know Donna, so I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to tease her. Donna, buffalo herds on Juma are of variable size. And you'll find that in the winter, or certainly in the dry season, they get a bit bigger than normal because the water's concentrated. And then when it gets a little bit towards the summertime and there is water in all the pans and we've had a lot of rain, then these herds can split up. And you'll find tiny herds of 10 or 12 sometimes, but often around about 50 or 60 in a herd as opposed to 100 to 200. I have seen herds of 1,000 strong, plus minus, at this time of the year in this part of the world. Still not much by way of sound. You can hear a few ox peckers going. Fighting with each other. And the last of the buffalo now disappearing off towards the northeast. Not so much in a cloud of dust, but more in a whisper of dust. Quite like that. I must remember it. A whisper of dust. Ah, uh, Mary J, uh, I think I know you as well, all the way from Buffalo, New York. And you want to, you say I must tell the, the buffalo to take their flies with them. Now, you know what's interesting, Mary J, in fact, I'm going to show it to you, is that I originally thought, and Panda thought, that the flies were coming from the buffalo, and I don't think that they are. Let me show you where I think they're coming from. Not me, but I'll show you. And I remember this, and I don't know why, I mean, I didn't know it immediately, but they tend to, I think they pupate on these guari trees. So we were parked in the shade of this guari bush here, right here, and I think that these flies pupate on the tree, because as soon as we moved out from under the tree, the flies disappeared, and as we sit here, I suspect they, yep, here they come. Here they come. And so I think the adult flies lay their eggs, this, whatever species of fly this is, lay their eggs on the tree and they pupate there. And then when a mammal goes past, they'll fly onto that mammal. Now you can hear them again, right? Interesting, huh? Cool. All right, we're going to move on from here, head more towards the east and the south, and uh, Setters has managed to find you a mammal, uh, which has probably got horns, certainly the male version thereof. Good luck, uh, Chris. I'm holding uh, thumbs that you come right with those uh, wild uh, dogs. And we're in the Mulwati, as you can see, we are sitting here with a beautiful uh, male Niola. Stunning boy, not the biggest, he's still got some growing to, to get to. But at the moment, he's all by himself here, and this is a typical kind of uh, 
habitat for Nyala Nasli in the riverbeds, in the riverines. And he's just enjoying the coolness here with us. As you can see, he's taking in the oxygen with his nose and breathing out, but very quick, very quick. He's trying to cool down as well. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, eh? Yeah, he's actually cute. Really almost folds his top lip back there while he's breathing in. Of course. Oh, he's seeing something this side. So, of course, this is the area where we saw Marips this morning. But he sees something that we didn't, we don't see. I'm just looking. Well, if he does bark here next to us, it's going to give me a fright, first of all. It will f give me a huge fright. Who's looking? What are you looking at? So he's going to be our eyes and our nose and ears for now. As you can see, he's got big ears and he can really pick up on noises and all the scent or even see a predator before we even can see it. So, a perfect place to be to sit here and hoping that he will give us indication. I'm going to get my binocs out here quickly on the other side. Janine, yes, the, so the patterns are stunning. That white stripe across the nose from eye to eye is just so beautiful. And the two little white doc, uh, dots coming down on the side of his face as well. And uh, they are quite pretty. And with those big, big ears. I just like the kudu as well. I so just pretty much built to be in these real thick areas. And then you've got those beautiful white lines coming vertically down the flanks and he's got this amazing like orange socks like long socks but he is beautiful but he's still watching that side he's still very alert on something oh, what is that what, what is that what is that something's moving there oh good hyena sorry that's what it says hyena moving into the distance sorry Kurt. I don't think you'll get it now. Uh, yeah, sorry, no, that hyena is far inside there. Mm, but there's a hyena walking around there. Just got a quick glimpse of the hyena. I actually almost thought it was a, a leopard there. That's, yeah, maybe it might be one here. Yeah, maybe that's why the hyenas are around. Maybe my ribs might be very close by. Can you hear them? I can actually see a few of the iron there, but I can't see it. It's difficult. I just barely saw movement now. But maybe two or three iron there. Mm. Well, you can see he's still watching, but now he knows it's not a leopard, he knows it's a... And not a... Uh, Momo, first of all, it's not a kudu, this is a niala. And second of all, maybe just tearing up there due to maybe something was got into his eye. And of course, just really kind of using the, the tear ducts just to push that dust out of, the, out of its eye. It's quite hot today as well. You can see a little bit of moisture dripping from its lips as well. There's a lot of water coming through and a lot of tears coming through that side. Maybe that's a little bit of a windy, maybe a little bit of stuff that's in the eyes. Plus, it's also a dry day. You must remember the dry heat. So if you've got a dry heat and this dry wind, like a dry breeze, 
it's also going to kind of really dry those eyeballs out quite a bit. So of course this for from uh, moisture and all that. Looks like another vehicle's coming in and chasing this thing away now. Anyway, another vehicle is just coming here. All right, well, we're going to move on and all that, and we're going to take a look what else we can find around here. Tadiwa, we're just going to, that's... I have to start moving. Daddy was still there. All right, I think maybe you've lost her. Hello. Oh. And uh, well, we're gonna have a stop first at the dam in the central parts in Tlovi Dam. Check what's there. Spend about five or ten minutes there, and then we'll we'll continue further south. got a question there and unfortunately I only copied two or three words there uh, it seems like our communication Mm-hmm. 
for the rest of the lionesses. Technical glitches today. Uh, apparently that hyena was in a position where we couldn't get any signal, which is very odd. Anyway, I think that it's probably, be the hyena is probably coming to this little used Good den afternoon. site. Sorry about that. Um, and you can see that the bones have been dragged there, so clearly there have been some bone-eating animals. Sometimes you'll find this at hyena dens, and sometimes it'll be porcupines that have dragged bones and things to the entrance of their burrow. But I think, given the proximity of the other hyena, this is probably hyenas. Just quickly going to talk on the radio. The last station, there's a breeding herd of buffalo mobile northeast from Treehouse Dam. No other update so far. Let me just reverse out. I think we've probably got all the entertainment that we're going to from this particular sighting. I was hoping that there might be a leopard draped in a tree, or a kill at least, with the proximity of that hyena, but it hasn't been the case, and nor was it the case with Cedric and his hyenas earlier. We'll just keep an eye out on all the horizontal branches and tree forks. It is astounding, psychologically, when you come past an area where you've seen a leopard before, there is a, some piece of you that assumes you're going to see a leopard in exactly the same place, even though you know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that, well, you know that you, there's about a 1% chance of you seeing a leopard in exactly the same spot again. Doesn't stop you looking then. I rather like that Nyala and crying. My tear ducts are trying to get rid of dust and wind and heat. And probably quite a lot of sunscreen mixed in. I haven't managed to find any other obvious shade tree candidates. So I've remained in the vehicle, much to Panda's delight. Oh, yeah, Lynn, it's a good question. Where are my short sleeves, you say? It's so hot, why am I wearing long sleeves? It's because of the sun. I've decided that it is irresponsible of me to be just wearing you know, short sleeves every day out in the sun. I don't think it's particularly good for me. So I've taken to wearing long sleeves. I'm not sure how long I'll be able to stand it. You know, I used to roll them up at least. But it does make mean that I don't arrive home with uh, arms that are burnt to crisp every day. So it's for health reasons. Uh, I don't, you haven't seen this, but BK Bokomoso Malinga the cameraman that is working with Cedric knows he's actually on more afternoon off. Credit is with Cedric today. But BK wears full arm protectors and full leg protectors, no matter how hot it is. And I look at him and I have to go and have a cold shower immediately because he just looks so deeply uncomfortable. I realise that could have been interpreted in two ways, what I just said there, but I made it in the way that I said it. <laughs> the less pure of you would have picked it up. If you did pick up, pick it up, you're not a pure person and you should go and purify yourself. If you didn't, then you don't need to worry. Right, we've now arrived at the dam called Twin Dams, where, quite surprisingly, there is only one dam. There is no twin.
to this one dam. Oh, and we've got some rinocerante over there. I don't know if that is a rhinoceros in Italian. I've just made it up. We'll stop up top here in the shade and we'll be these rhinos that are just enjoying the mud. One, two, three of them. Very nice. Hornless rhino. There we go. We'll just have a quick look here. Oh, they really don't have any horns. Shame. Still, they look very relaxed and very happy. And like they're having a very pleasant afternoon. I'd like to be doing what they're doing. Obviously not in the same water body. Well, Vinnie KP, you've asked an interesting question because it's unanswerable. You say, does the summer in Africa come with a lot of rain? Now, you must remember that Africa is roughly i think it's four times the size of the continental united states three or four times the size and it straddles the equator and therefore it, stra it has any number of climatic zones and so yes in this part of the world the summer does come with a lot of rain and by this part of the world i mean northeastern south africa and in fact northern south africa in general southwestern south africa you know, the southwest, the Cape Town and, and the Western Cape get a lot of winter rain. They don't get any rain in the summer at all. And then, obviously, it's not summer. It's going into winter in the northern hemisphere of Africa. And so they won't have much rain, except for the Mediterranean parts, which will get winter rain. So, I mean, we get questions like this quite a lot. You know, what's the weather like in Africa? Or do you get summer rain in Africa? It just depends on where you are. But there are large parts of Africa where, that are characterized by afternoon thunderstorms. If you go to East Africa, especially around the equator, they don't really have summer and winter. They have two rainy seasons, the long rains and the, the short rains. And during those periods, you have these monstrous thunderstorms that come through in the afternoon. It's absolutely wonderful if you don't have to be out in them and if you can just be around them and watching them. Now this is particularly typical rhinoceros behavior here. They're having a good snooze in the mud. And they're totally relaxed and they look a bit depressed. And who can blame them? It's been a rough time for rhino over the last decade or so. <laughs> yes, Lisa, they look like what I wish I was doing as well. They're enjoying themselves a pleasant swim. Although one of them's had enough of a swim and he's just showing us his bottom. Fair enough. I think rhinos have got pretty good bottoms. Well, I've discussed wilderness bottoms quite a lot and possibly even second after the <laughs> I think they're the second best bottom after zebra uh, Shaney you said that I, I got it right uh, rhino is rinocerante in Italian or something similar hooray are you impressed panda I'm impressed. Hmm. I was I was chatting with Maxwell today, who's our technical guy here, and he's learning Shangan, and obviously he speaks Zulu quite well, and he's a fluent Tswana speaker, and uh, and obviously an exceptional English speaker too. 
and he's learning Shangan and <laughs> we were chatting away in English and then he said something to one of our ladies in the camp and all he did was add a Z, a DZ to a Zulu word and hope that that would make it Shangan and it didn't and it was very funny. Anyway, Sedas apparently has also managed to find some Arinocerante, so let's go over to him and see what his are doing. Well, looks like uh, we've also got some rhinos. Well, thank you, James. We've got a mom with a little calf. Look, a little one. And on the little one's nose, he's got some poo right on top there. And one must have, like, pooed on his nose. Oh, that's all right. Don't worry. That'll just fall off very soon. Like a little bit. Well, how cute is this little white rhino? Isn't this so adorable? I don't go hide behind mom. Oh, he wants to suckle. You can just see the little mouth going between mom's back legs here. Oh. And it's making a noise. It's making a noise. <gasps> Daddy, what can you hear it? Thanks for letting me know. Because the little one is complaining. It wants some milk. Like, Please, Mom, I want some milk. And I think around her babies make the cutest, cutest noises out of most animals. It's such a, like a big animal and they make is like, mm -hmm. Yourself, little one. <laughs> Mommy's not. Mommy's not too interested now. In <laughs> Her little white rhino is really complaining. He wants milk. Remember the late characters of Juma? Do you miss Dark Mane's strength? Do you wonder how many cubs Purple Eye left behind? On the 17th of September, Wild Earth takes a trip down memory lane in honor of Animal Remembrance Month. Join Tessa and James for a special Ask Me Anything and learn about the history of our fallen favorites and the future of their legacies. Watch it live on your nearest device. Wild Earth, it's in your nature.
All right, they are gone, so we're not going to follow further that side. I think they have moved a little bit further behind us, and uh, I don't want to put too much stress on that little baby. So off they go. Bye bye. All right, how awesome was that? That was brilliant. That was brilliant. Nice to see a little white rhino calf. It looked like a little male as well. Oh. Babies, 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 babies. I always say it as well, even like with the youngsters, we always try I never try and go and chase after them and try and stay with them because you know the young ones are still very skeptical about the vehicles and not so relaxed like the older ones. So you never want to put that kind of pressure on the young youngsters. So that's why I'd rather leave it, let it be. Here we have got our little rhino, and I think that, uh, well, I'm trying to work out the arrangement here. It might be a cow and a calf and a bull, but certainly not a young calf like Cedric Scott, obviously. This one is probably a bored young male who's asking his parents to perhaps take him off to the, take him off to the the cinema rather than just sit around at home on a Friday evening. Yes, thank you James Richard. As you say, uh, considering that Rhino's closest relatives out here are the zebra, the only other odd-toed ungulate, uh, yes, I suppose you're right, the good bums run in the distant family. Well pointed out. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. It's a very peaceful scene here, but for the slightly vociferous objections of a blacksmith lapwing in the background. You can see the light starting to soften now as the rhino is turning a honey gold colour as opposed to plain white earlier. Baby's given up on going to the ice cream shop while well, his mum and dad have a Friday afternoon ziz. Most likely a mum and older sibling. In fact, not. I think probably lying against mum and probably dad, actually. I heard a cuckoo. No, it's not a cuckoo. Letty, if you hadn't been concentrating, you'd have uh, you'd have mistaken these for hippo. Well, I mean they're the similar size. They have same similar coloured coats, although hippos normally have a bit of pink about them. Uh, but otherwise. Mm, it's not very similar, but I can see why you'd make that mistake in this particular environment, you know, lying in the water like that. Very, very peaceful, soporific scene. I could quite easily drop off here. And I'm pretty sure that the rhino closest to us has dropped off. It was quite interesting as we drove up, he was exhaling. 
and his nostril the other side was in the water and it was blowing it was blowing a little spray of water yeah Enzo you can see them you say they also have ox peckers there they are you can see them on the bull's back close to us and on the calf's back and I've looked at them with my binoculars and I think they're all red-billed ox peckers. I don't think there are any yellow-billed there. And the yellow-billed ox pecker is the rarer one that we get here. And normally, but not always, normally you'll find them with big herds of ungulates as opposed to rhinos like this. But I've seen them with everything. I will just tell you, I'm not going to ask Panda to film them because, well, they're flitting about up here, some red-chested swallows, which is nice. I mean, Panda, by all means, if you feel like trying them, go for it. But they're not exactly easy. They're like bats. Now, there's one there, but it's miles away. There's the other one there. Ooh, Panda's gonna go for it, everybody. He's 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 doing it now. Now it's gone over the top of us, and all we've got is sky. Typical bird. Smoothly done, Panda. That's fine. No, CJ. As far as I'm aware, rhino skin. Oh, here we go. A rhino skin is, in fact, n not waterproof. At least it is waterproof. Blessings, Panda. I don't think it is nearly as absorbent as an elephant. They certainly don't have as many folds in the skin. It might be slightly less waterproof than ours, but I don't think it's as porous as a, an elephant's. Still has lots of cracks and things in it, which I suspect are there for a similar reason. Yeah, so I've got this right. There's a cow at the end, a bull closest to us, and a calf in between them. <laughs> That's what I was talking about. Look at him. Look at him picking up the mud on his face. Isn't that cool? HH, you say it must be really hot for them to be in the mud that long. Yeah, look, it is It is hot, but it's, uh, you know, rhino do this. They love to lie in the mud. And even when it's cooler than it has been today. Actually looks like he's eating some mud there. Engaging in some geophagia or eating of the earth. Ah, yes, we've seen these ones many times. There's the female who's burnt herself. Are you looking to take your bond with the wild to the next level? Download our app and access in-depth chats with our naturalists and special guests. Connect and converse in real time on our Ask Me Anythings, fireside chats, hangouts and town halls. WeChat, available on the Wild Earth app. Wild Earth, we are Safari.
Now, if you would like to help us on our mission to connect people with nature, to take these beautiful scenes around the world so that people might fall in love with nature and in so doing help conserve our last wild places, you can do that by going to wildearth.tv forward slash donations. And if you are unable to help us financially, please do us the favor of telling all your friends about us, your enemies, people you might come across, strangers you might see in an aeroplane, or you meet uh, standing in line at the post office, or at the uh, food store in the, in the line, you know, to pick up this week's meat special. Tell them about Wild Earth. We'd love to hear from them and you. Who knows, you might even make a new friend. See, look what we have here, two hyenas, the two that by accident got like darted off from me when they got a fright seeing me on foot earlier on. And it looks like we have found two of them. Looks like in Tima on the right hand side and it looks like in Guazi. No. Is it? Or Gangrika? Please help me on the one on the left. I don't know. Not too sure on the one on the left. But it look and that is in Tima on the right. Is it or not? No, it's not. It is. <laughs> but it's the two spotted hyenas. <clears throat> it is two spotted hyenas. So these are the two spotted hyenas that's been following more, uh, not Mawati, but they're in the Mawati, but following Marips, the young male leopard, uh, this morning. So I'm hoping that they are still hanging around here. Why? Because maybe Marips is still somewhere in the bushes, somewhere lying, enjoying his afternoon nap. And these two hyenas are just waiting for him to start getting a little bit more active. So we are going to hang around here for sure. And hoping that the young male leopard decides to come. Oh, I thought it was... Oh, yeah. Okay, oh, that's right, with that funny torn left ear, indeed. Thank you, Shrines. Yeah, Cedric, you're a little bit uh, rusty, eh? A little bit rusty. Oh, and I'm on rusty as well, maybe that's why. Uh, Corky is the one that's closest to us. Thank you, Shreyas. Thank you so much. So, Corky is one of... Uh, the high-ranking females in the Juma clan, if not the highest. I know this morning we found her with another two. I'm, I'm sure that other one, and there was another one with them, and they just followed Corky all around. And I'm sure it was in Bilu, the third one. And then that's, of course, uh, Corky's... No, that's Hart's cub. Oh, that's Hart's cub, and Bilu's Hart's cub, sorry. Oh. Just getting my facts right here quickly. Oh, did you see that Daker running across there? There was a Daker that just ran across the drainage line now. Like full, full speed. Interesting. As I said, we are going to just sit here patiently, hoping that these spotted hyenas will decide to... Denise, oh yes, definitely. The, the lower-ranked females will show respect, of course, uh, to Corky. Very important, you know. It's a clan. It's a clan. They really help each other when they need to kind of push something off a kill. So yes, no, they don't. Corky won't mind the um, low, lower-ranked females or males actually just hanging out with her for a, a little bit of adventure and looking for something to scavenge on. But when there is food, it's a different story. And of course, Corky is going to take priority on that. 
So if you're a young male or if you're a male itself and you want to hang around with females, well, you can. But just remember, you're not going to get the first uh, helping. You've got to wait. You know, female hyenas are ranked way higher than male hyenas in the hyena society. So I, th I, I've just got this little feeling where I can feel that there is uh, old Marep, that young Marep, it is around here. So very. Uh, Oh, oh, is it Comet? Let me get my binox out here. So you say it is Comet, the other one. So Comet is, of course, the male that hangs around here with the Juma clan. I just want to take a look at quickly. I've got my binox out here. I don't see that. You remember he had that big wound. So it looks like his gash on his back left area has healed pretty well. Because when about a month ago when we saw those black damn males grabbing Nguazi on the head. Uh, Comet was also quite injured at that time. He had a few bite marks and he was bleeding. But it seems like he is doing very well. So, okay, so we've got Comet and Corky. Well, could this be a moment of uh, romance? You never know, in the riverbed? Hmm. I guess time will tell. We've got a beautiful black-headed oriole. That's making that noise. How is the hyena that was bitten by the lion? Kit Kat? Um, yeah, Gwazi is fine. I haven't seen Gwazi yet, but I know that uh, Trish and uh, Tess had Nguazi just before I came back and a few little marks on his head but nothing, nothing substantial, nothing hectic at all. I thought he's going to be way worse off but it seems like he's, he or oh, she healed very quickly and um, uh, it is looking all good and well. But that's typical, very resilient, uh, these wild animals are very resilient. So. You know, it's survival of the fittest. If you're not going to yield quickly, well, you are going to pay the price for that. So they need to make sure that they keep the wound nice and clean, if they can, and uh, continue with life yeah, in the bush. We can see these two hyenas keep on looking back. They keep on looking back here. Something's lying here. Somewhere. But nice little area for them here in the Mawati, nice and cool on the sand, cool sand, and uh, especially on a hot day like today. So it is so, so nice for them. Wumbugal, yes, romance in the riverbed. <laughs> it sounds like, it sounds like a song to me. Romance in the riverbed, sung by some country artist. Yeah, what do you... <laughs> it just sounds like a country song to me. Romance in the, in, in the riverbed. <laughs> Lying right next to each other as well. How cute is that? Well, I haven't seen Corky for a long time. I don't know. Well, I did see Corky there when the third hippo carcass, but uh, after that, I haven't seen Corky for quite, quite some time. So nice to get to see this uh, female hyena and as, I mean she has also had her fair share on being attacked by a male lion, a dark mane um, I think it was not last year, a year before one of the male lions that used to roam this area, old dark mane he gave uh, Corky a good old hiding but she recovered very well And she had a cub about two years ago, Koa. I don't know exactly where Koa has ended up. I don't know if we've got but to see Koa again. No idea on that as well. But how, how nice is this? I'm just going to sit here and enjoy this moment. Uh, 
Veronica is asking, are they often seen in uh, riverbeds in the open like this? Well, Veronica, yeah, on hot days. That's why you always do these riverbeds on, on really warm days. On really warm days, you know, you never know. Maybe you find a leopard lying in the riverbed, hyenas, rhino, buffalo, elephant, even, you know. So on a hot day like this, sand is nice and cool. Nicely open for them as well, and uh, they feel very, very relaxed in this manner. But of course, the best thing is just to wait for them. The best thing is just to wait for them and just to see if we get any other um, movement from these hyenas. As soon as, if there is a leopard around you, you'll find that these hyenas will quickly stand up and then start following that leopard. Why they do that? Um, main thing is, of course, they're waiting for that opportunity. If a leopard does bring down something and doesn't hoist that kill up into the tree, and then you've got two hyenas like Corky and Comet, and you know, they will really steal the kill from the leopard and take that opportunity to grab some food for themselves. So that's if the leopard is still around. But I've got that feeling it's here somewhere. Not everyone gets excited to hear a leopard chuff, spot a pangolin, or see a real impala rut. But if you are wild about the wild, you can become part of a community of like-minded nature lovers and share authentic wildlife experiences with the world. Join the Explorers Club and you will also enjoy the many benefits that come with it too. Wild with Explorers, it's in your nature. So usually with a hyena, female hyena, if she does have cubs, uh, it's usually around about 18 months, 19 months uh, before she will go into heat again. So if you think about when Koa, when was Koa born? 
So Koa, of course, is uh, Corky's cub. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was, no, not two years ago, maybe about a year, a year, uh, six months maybe, a year and a half. Anyway, all right, well, we are going to sit here with uh, these two hyenas and still look out for anything else. Uh, I think uh, a very fitting clip that's going to be played now is from a female hyena that many knew back in the days, all pretty. <laughs> Pretty was here. She was lying in a different entrance to the den. I think she wants to come out and lie in the sun. I was just hoping the little one would come out properly. So this jackal is being probably a little bit more protective than looking for an eagle for its food, which is very, very interesting. This is something I've never seen before, but looking at it closely now, it looks to be a tawny eagle by the fact that the gape on the mouth doesn't extend past the eye. But needless to say, it is an eagle. It's landed on the ground. Uh, Bat-eared foxes being in the area denning choose their den sites very specifically for food resource uh, being harvested termites. So there's a good chance the tawny eagle or the eagle itself is walking around trying to snatch up some food in the form of insects. And the jackal is having none of it. Snazzy, that is a very big bird, but if the bird pl doesn't play his cards right, the jackal could have it, because the jackals are very, very quick, very, very fast, and they can bite quite powerfully. I am very sorry about all of the technical glitches that we are having today. Friday afternoon, no felines just yet, just a lot of gremlins. And if you are a new viewer, the gremlins are the things that attack us when we fail to get our high-definition signal out of the bushveld and into your home. And we will now have a look at a very nicely side-lit hornbill and we'll follow that up with some fairly horrifically backlit lilac-breasted rollers which will look like blackbirds because of the lighting. That is the inimitable yellow red-billed hornbill and you can tell that he's called a red-billed yeah, hornbill right. Because, all together now, ready, Panda, he's got a? Correct, a red bill. Sorry, everyone, my radio is going crazy. With absolutely nothing of any use whatsoever. And now we'll have a look at the lilac breast rollers. Yeah, there we go. That's not so badly lit. It's a little bit of side light. and still very quiet because it's still pretty hot and the little dusk chorus that we have at this time of year hasn't begun yet. There's such an air of expectancy around the bush at this time of year 
as the breeding season, especially for the birds, is about to kick off. I wonder if they look forward to it, or if it's just a time of huge stress, because it must be pretty stressful, setting up a territory, finding a mate, building a nest, laying eggies, incubating eggies, and then feeding chicks. Near P, do certain bird species hang together for safety like some mammal species would? I, I don't know. I mean, you get bird parties that move around together, but I think that's largely for food. Maybe there's an element of safety in it as well. You know, if you find a southern black tit, you'll often find lots of other birds moving with it. Some battises, maybe some apalises, prinias, brew-brews, that sort of thing, all moving together and eating slightly different sized insects. I don't know if they do it for safety, though. Um, that's a really interesting question. I don't know. Mongooses and hornbills quite frequently spend time t together, uh, dwarf mongooses and hornbills. And we think that there might be a safety element in that. It's a good question. I don't know the answer for that. I can't think of an example where that would happen, but the reason I sound a bit confused is that I can't see why it wouldn't. And so I think that maybe the presumption that a bird party will also use other species for safety as well as finding food is probably not a bad one. What has this bird done? Oh, it's doing the splits almost, I see. It's perched on two different sticks. And it's taking oil there out of the preening gland and then putting it onto the rest of the body. The preening gland's just behind the tail there. That's quite nice to see, actually. So taking a bit of oil out of the preening gland behind the tail and then spreading it on the rest of the feathers to maintain their integrity, repair them, and to keep them waterproof. Yes, I'm talking about you. That is correct. Do it again. No, not there. Look under your tail first. And quite apart from the fact that this is very good for just the sort of maintenance of waterproofing, if you're going to spend your air, your time suspended in the air, you would best make sure that the equipment that you use to suspend yourself in the air is in good health and good repair. Because if it isn't, you are likely to plummet from the sky to an early death. I think it's probably quite reasonable to assume, therefore, that you don't find many birds who are lazy with their hygiene, certainly not many uninjured birds. Hmm. And often spend this time looking at a yellow billed, at least a red billed hornbill, but he's really quite nicely perched and he's behaving in quite an interesting manner. Not to mention perching in a slightly strange manner, too. Jennifer, common bird parties normally are constituted by insect eaters. So like I said, we'd have southern black tits. In fact, I can hear one calling in the background. Yellow-bellied eromomolas, yellow-throated apalus, spar-throated apalus, chin-spot batis, brew-brew shrike, maybe a black-headed oriole with them. Uh, that sort of thing. They'd be the ones that normally move together. 
Well, there it is. All right, Panda, let us continue. I've no doubt our leopard is going to step out onto the road shortly. You know, the light has softened sufficiently for us to take good pictures of a leopard, so surely, inevitably, a leopard must arrive. Quang. Is this my stick or yours? You kept it for the flies, did you? No, no. Oh, I lost mine. All right, you can have that one then. I'll pick another. Panda has retained his quarry bush so that he may beat the stuffing out of any pl fly that sits upon him. Fair enough. We're now on the far eastern boundary of Juma. We did a brief sojourn into the reserve to the south of us called Chitwa. It's all starting to feel rather nice now after the volcanic mind melting heat of the start. Hmm. There's a little sparrow hawk, little sparrow hawk there. Do you remember the stars of Juma? Tandi, Hosanna, Darkmane, and many more will appear in our tribute. In honor of Animal Remembrance Month, join us as we look back at the characters that stole millions of hearts across the globe. Watch it live. Wild Earth. We are Safari. Conservation, ready to take your knowledge and skills to the next level? Look no further than the four eco-training courses in Kenya, the ultimate destination for aspiring conservationists and nature enthusiasts. Step into a world of discovery as you join eco-training's renowned courses in the heart of Kenya's Masai Mara. Immerse yourself in the diverse ecosystems of out of Africa, guided by our team of expert instructors. From wildlife tracking to bird identification, bushcraft skills to habitat assessment, our comprehensive courses offer you hands-on experiences that will deepen your understanding of the natural world and equip you with invaluable conservation skills. Engage with local communities, learn from their wisdom, and understand the vital role that they play in sustainable conservation. Embark on thrilling field excursions where you'll witness breathtaking landscapes and encounter Kenya's iconic wildlife up close. 
From the Masai Mara to Amboseli National Park, every moment will be a source of inspiration and wonder. These courses are the perfect way to gain a deep understanding of the African bush, even if you have limited time. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to experience the wild in a meaningful and life-changing way. Enroll today and embark on a transformative journey with eco-training in Kenya's Masai Mara, the leading force in conservation education. Well, well we've got the third hyena that uh, made its uh, way now into the Malwati. Um, but it's staying away from uh, Comet and uh, Corky. As soon as this one that we've got in frame, I'm not too sure exactly who this is. Um, it's a little bit far for me now at the moment, so if anybody's got an, an ID for me, please let me know. But I cannot see from where I am now. So that's no idea. So, of course, when this third one came into the riverbed, it was quite interesting. We all actually had... Um, well, Corky, uh, not Corky, Comet stood up next to Corky and he's displayed this typical, um, I can say, dominant uh, display, letting the other one know, don't come close to this uh, female because I am pretty much the dominant male of uh, the Juma clan and uh, maybe she might be in heat. That's why he's sticking right next to her. But you can see that hot wound of uh, Comet, he's got that wound on his back of his head. So, but it looks like it is cleaning up very nicely and healing quite well. So that's a good thing. But yeah, now he is not leaving Corky's side at all. And as soon as he started making a noise, the other hyena down the riverbed decided to, okay, I will stop and go lie down. I'm not going to approach the two of you. So yes, this could be maybe time, maybe Corky is going into heat. It's very, very possible. Just by the body language of uh, Comet and of course there's the noises he was making earlier. But still no luck on uh, the leopard. So, no idea, maybe Marips has disappeared. Top cat, uh, top cat, does the riverbed fill up during rainy seasons? Top cat, well, this summer we had big rains, good rains. It would filled up properly, not completely, wouldn't cover the vehicle where we are now. Well, very close, actually, very close. Sorry, I actually saw the river when it was practically in full flow, so, yes. Hello, looks like uh, Corky's coming towards us. Let's see a comet falling very hot on her heels. What do you see behind us? Is there something here? Look at him, look at him. He doesn't let her out of sight, so he's just sticking right next to her. And just snuffing away. But yes, this riverbed can, but it has to take a lot of rain. Pretty much flash floods. We'll have flash floods coming through. And that doesn't happen every year. That happens very seldom. Sometimes it could be three, four years without any flash floods here. Yeah? And then all of a sudden we'll have one year like last year, good rain in our summertime where it filled this riverbed with water. But then it subsides as well. Just as quick as it comes, it goes down. You can just see he's standing there. He's he's showing that the other, showing the other one. Listen, you are not going to come close to Corky. This is the female that I want, and I'm going to stick with her. Well, there goes the honeymoon couple on their way out, on the, out for some dinner. Enjoy you two. Have a wonderful time. I can see he's still looking. 
There's something, uh... Uh, and another hyena just made its way into the sighting. I'll just go a little bit forward. I'm just going to go a bit forward, yeah. I can see Corky showing a lot of dominance there. Interesting. Well, I don't know who arrived there, but clearly, clearly, Comet is chasing whoever around that side now. I'm going to go up there. Now, let's quickly go up. Let's quickly go up. All right, we're going to go up there. All right. Let's go see what's happening. Let's go see what's happening. Do a handbrake turn. And break turn. Yes, we can do it. Also, all right. Come on, Rusty. Don't worry. Don't die. Let's go, let's go see. <laughs> Don't go to the robot now, again. <laughs> they're going back in down. Oh, no. No, wait, they're not. But they're very interested in something here. Tails are up. There's something here. Oh, there's another hyena that's coming in. Oh, there's a third one, fourth one. Ooh, they're all getting so excited. You can see their tails are up. They're all excited. All right, let's go forward. All right. This is wonderful, wonderful hyena action. Chasing old comet uh, around there. It looks like it might be in Bilu, that the one that just came in as well. And Bilu is, of course, a female that's a youngster from heart. Lindy, yes, it's so nice having some hyena action again. Looks like all the. It's amazing they just come out of the woodwork out of nowhere and. Uh, it just shows you patience paid off here this afternoon with these hyenas. As you can see, I think I see a white aerial going past here. It looks like old James is heading further north there. Eh? But you can see typical greeting, uh, always a greeting manner for hyenas, just sniffing the genitals. So when you see those tails are up like that, it means excitement. And they do get excited. They lift their tails up. And you can see Comet is really excited. Still looking out for that other hyena that was in the riverbed a little bit earlier. He's just making sure that that one is not going to come anywhere close to where Corky is. You can see looking back again. Oh, what a sighting. Hey. Steve D, this was brilliant for sure. Uh, I think this was fantastic action. Getting some hyena interaction like this. Nothing better, especially the noises that you get. How they laugh like that. <laughs> I love it. Whoop, oh, you can see that guy's comment. No. And it's just this little fluffy one that's, uh, yeah, I think this is spirit, if I'm not mistaken. It looks like spirit. Very difficult to say. Well, I'm sure Tadiwa will give me a rundown on, on comments coming through for which hyenas. Where, yeah. I 
here comes that other one that was lying in the riverbed coming this way. Let me see what's going to happen here now. This one is making its way to the rest. So this is a hyena with uh, pretty much at Corky. Uh, not Corky, Comet, not allowed close to Corky. There might be another male, a bit of a scar on this back left area. Forest Monarch, it does look like they're on a mission, and so we're going to get on our mission now. So let's see, let's, we're going to follow up here. How nice, Forest Monarch, lovely, 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 lovely. I'm just making sure there's no leopard behind us. It's just a following. This is that time of the day, the sun is setting, it's getting nice and cool and uh, of course the nocturnal animals are starting to get a little bit more active. There's another one here. So the other two that came in was Cacao and Intima. Uh, Sorry, uh, oh, this one's running after that one there. It's running after. Whoa, they are running. Yo. So, the uh, comet doesn't want that one around. It just shows again. As soon as Comet saw that other hyena come in, he just straight ran for it and uh, trying to chase it away. So. Must be another male though. <sighs> oh. Yo, uh, Comet is on a mission, eh? He's on a mission. That's like they say, a man on a mission. See, he's not happy with that other one, so. I'm just looking back. Corky making her way back the side to Comet. See that tail still up. Carol K, it's Ayina Alabalu, yes, indeed, Carol K. Ayina's on a mission. That's what we've got here at the moment. Okay, looks like the two of them are back again together. one that's just passing us but we're gonna just see it we'll see it just right now oh we're coming back again that side eh? sounds like almost like sounds like in the belly's uh, noise that one we're gonna, we're gonna go let's go wow hyena's calling hyena's running after hyenas here it's more like hyena warfare at the moment than anything else. Let's see, let's see. Sometimes it's a good thing to follow hyenas. They might lead us to another predator. Oh, you know, it's never know. We'll see. I got the one there. Look at 
these two are still moving towards Chilla Pan now. One of the pens here on Pundams Road. Maybe they're going to go for a swim in Chilla Pan. You never know. All right, well, we're going to go follow here and get to Chilla Pan. Let's go to Chris with a beautiful sunset. Oh, that sounded like a lovely hyena encounter that Cedric had there. I was just listening to the commentary that is being fed to us uh, by, by the directors so they keep us up to date with what's happening all across the location so that we know how the flow of the show goes. There's a little bit of insight to behind the scenes there. Anyway, that time of day, look at that. Beautiful specimen of a knobthorn tree. Big one. With the sun going down behind it and very small in the horizon we can see a little bit of the mountain so we can actually see the sun or portion of it disappearing behind the mountain you can actually see there just the silhouette of the mountains in the background there Again, an exquisite Pridelands sunset. And that is something I look forward to every single day. Rolling trouble, definitely sky art time. Nature is the artist, yeah. Take nothing away from OD who's capturing this like a boss. And I'm just watching it, I'm just enjoying it. <laughs> I am just enjoying it. Wild Earth is home to Africa's endangered unicorn. We aim to inspire the protection of our rhinos by connecting people to them. I am here with a beautiful female rhino and her calf. Join our naturalists as we track our favorite rhinos on safari. Hello big boy. Watch it live and join the rush this Rhino Day with Wild Earth.
see maybe later on in about 10 minutes we get that nice glow perhaps yeah we just found leopard on ingwe alley we followed those calls it's how we roll cedric it's how we roll Hello everybody, sorry I was just chatting to Cedric on the radio there, we've got a little male leopard, look at that, I don't think that's muddy, is it? I wish I could recognise these cats, that's not Maribs, is it? Maribs isn't tutu, oh my goodness, I'm so bad at this, it distresses me deeply. Let me just quickly check my ID kit. I carry one all the time because I'm so bad. But somebody's going to tell me quickly. Young male. Oh, come on, James. You hopeless individual. Oh, man. It is Maribs. Phew. I thought it was. I thought it was. I thought it was. <laughs> you know, now I can see it. Okay. I'm so bad. So, we heard baboon's alarm calling, which I think Sid has heard as well, and he got hold of us and told us. Hang on a second. Hooray, yes, thank you. Alex, you said James for the win on Feline Friday. Yes, indeed. James for the win. I wish he'd just sit there and happily not move because it would be very pleasant if he would relax and enjoy himself. I think he's going to, ooh, he's climbing up onto the, let me move the board. There he goes. He's investigating something or other. In Matthews, you say, what's up, my boy, Maripse? Uh, well, yes, quite. What's up is that he's, uh, he's smelling something. Possibly looking for something to eat. And you know what first alerted us? And he's salivating as well. There's something going on here. Look at that. So the first thing that gave us the, an idea that there might be a predator here was the buffalo herd. We re came across it and it was half of them started running. Look, he's Fleming grimacing. Someone has come along here and been scent marking. And he's picking up on the smell and it's making him salivate. Now this could be his father that's wandered along here. And scent marked. It could be Tlalumba who's wandered along here. And of course Tlalumba's urine right now. <laughs> Hell of a picture that. Tlalumba's urine right now, if she is pregnant, and as heavily pregnant as I think she is, will smell very odd. He looks almost kind of sorry. Um, let me move quietly. He looks almost uncomfortable, you know, sort of a little bit stressed.
There he is, just going off onto that log. I have to tell you, if he goes too much deeper in here, he's going to be tricky to follow, but we will try. Topcat, you says leopard time, so beautiful, it sure is. All right, I'm gonna move. We're gonna go around this termite mound, the other side, because the elephants have pushed a tree over here and made life very inconvenient. Oh gosh, this is going to be tough. I'm just wandering down here, Get ready for your daily dose of African wildlife magic. Be enchanted by the intimate moments shared by the animals as they drink, play and interact in their natural habitat. With our daily wildlife videos, you'll experience the thrill of safari adventures without ever having to leave your seat. Let the wild adventure unfold right before your eyes. Africam, always live, always wild. Now, we've managed to catch up with him. He crossed through the little drainage line. We did some off-roading. And before we continue discussing what he's doing, I must just say that, you know, Cedric's congratulating me. I'm not actually the one that spotted him. It was Panda who spotted him. So, you know, credit where credit's due. All right, let's move. He's got his tail up in that typical sign of truce to the birds, which started alarm calling at him as he came up through here. I don't believe it. We're quite far from camp, but I can, I can smell supper. <laughs> just wandering through here. The buffalo herd is over there. We can just see them through there. And Maripre is heading towards the kind of old hyena dens, which I was going to go and check. I'm just 
have one look at him here, and then I'll keep moving. No, 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 no. Annabelle, that's why it's quite interesting, this behavior. He hasn't settled into his own territory. He's in his father's territory, and his father will give him a hiding if he starts marking or starts marking too too much. I did see him scraping his back legs back there. So he's hitting adolescence, or he's hit adolescence by now. And, you know, so he's going to start doing things like marking the odd bush. It's unlikely he'll start to call, but he's going to leave his scent around the place, and that is eventually going to irritate his father. And either he will... I mean, it's very unlikely he'll have a conflict with his father, but his father might indicate that he should press on, or he'll just feel like this is a territory that's full, and he's feeling the urge to go and set up his own territory, and then he'll go away. He's definitely getting to that age, though. Let's carry on. Rather wonderful to have a little kitty tonight. Well, so 50, we all hope that, but inevitably he will get himself into trouble of some kind, and that's a question of whether he'll get out of that trouble, I suppose. Young Marie. I think one of the reasons, apart from my incompetence, that I failed to recognize him immediately was that there is a piece of me that desperately would like to see Nzemba again. There's another young male leopard, and this guy's cousin. You can hear the roller shouting at him. It's the lilac breasted roller giving him hell. Well, Teresa Berry, is he old enough to mate? Um, he's probably old enough to conceive. Well, he wouldn't conceive, but, well, he would, I suppose, with his partner. And, you know, his his brother, Tamba, I don't think he was a father at three, but he was a well, he was father before he was four, if I'm not mistaken. And so, yes, in theory, he would be old enough to mate, uh, but not necessarily. He'd remember to have a... to have a a successful offspring, he'd have to look after a territory and protect it from marauding males, unrelated males, and he wouldn't be big enough to do that, I don't think. I mean, he's a chunky fellow, but he's not, he's by no means the size of his father yet. Some hyenas calling. Cedric's not right that there's some lions around. All right, let's drive up through this little gap here. This used to be an old hyena den as well. This block is full of hyena dens. He's heading towards 
one of the most commonly used ones. As far as we're aware, inactive now. What's that? You're going to infrared. Okay. Honda has decided we are going to infrared now because it has become too dark. Wang. 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 No, we're not going to infrared just yet. There's a small malfunction that Panda will sort out as I navigate this rather intense pile of logs placed here by an inconsiderate elephant. Okay, we made it. Panda, are we going to infrared? Or does the camera need to be reset? Okay. See, now look. See what he's doing there? He's marking everyone and he's scraping his back legs. Hmm. Right, we'll keep up with old Maripse. He's heading towards Treehouse Dam, and you're going to go back to Cedric, who's uh, driving about. Nice, uh, James. You know, like that's how that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes. Eh? That's how the cookie crumbles. You do a lot of footwork during the daytime, getting your shoe full of mud, trying to look for that young male leopard, and uh, I'm glad, I'm really stoked that uh, old Jemos has uh, found Marips for the evening. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Good teamwork. Teamwork, dreamwork, teamwork is a dreamwork. Yes, something like that. Something down that line. As you can see, we are in infrared, so we are now in a night mode. But now, I've got my spotlight out, and it is time to search for some night animals. Thinking that the buffaloes are all on Philemon's cut line, they're close to uh, Taxon's Junction. And I'm hoping that's going to lure lions in tonight, really do. I think we... we uh, in need of some cats. Tomorrow is cat day, so let's see, let's see, let's see. Or oh, maybe for tomorrow morning, Shudulu and Cub. Oh, that would be brilliant. Brilliantos. Or oh, Shudulu and Cub. I think that'll be a nice one. Apparently, she was coming. All right, well, we're going to continue. Let's head over to James as he's got a better view on Mr. Fluffy Ears. Just gone behind that tree. I'm just sending a message to the rest of the guide. Z. Right, let's go. The radio doesn't work, so I just have to send a message on the, on the, on the WhatsApp. There he is in front of us. Hosan and Tingana, for those of you who don't know, were 
the predecessors, if you like, of these guys. Rosanna was this chap's cousin, uncle, and Tingana was Hosanna's father, and they had a rather special relationship for some strange reason. They spent a lot of time together. We have seen Mulwati, who's this guy's father, and him together in the same tree, uh, with Mulwati scavenging off his son, which is not unusual, it happens a lot. But we definitely haven't seen them meet up like we used to see Hosanna and Tangana meet up, and they'd have physical contact. I, would we describe it as affectionate? Um, almost, certainly. And I haven't seen that before. It's the first time I'd seen it, and I certainly haven't seen it with these guys. But both of Horsana and Tingana were very confiding, whereas Mawati isn't generally. Let me move forward. He's about to arrive at Treehouse Dam. <laughs> now he's turned around again, now he's smelling it. Lying on the, oh, he's lying in some buffalo dung there. And now he's licking the buffalo dung, which is fairly common behavior. I'm just going to try on the radio again. Any station copy me on this channel? Copy, got Maripse heading towards Treehouse Dam on Taxons Road, currently static. Copy that. This is very typical, and I'm sure it's got nutritional value. They often will also roll in the dung, which just masks their scent, I suppose, which is what he's doing now. But I think that bacteria that is in the de delicious, fresh buffalo patty must be useful to their digestion in some shape, way, or form. I'm glad we don't have to do that. Pande, imagine you had to have a three or four teaspoons of fresh buffalo turd before you tucked into your supper every night. No, it would be awful. Especially as you're a vegan and you don't know how many organisms there are in that. <laughs> Christelle, this is, you want the long or the short version to this? How do we come up with the names of these animals? In theory, it changes almost as often as I have had hot breakfasts, but in theory, it's the person who finds the cub first gets to name the cat. Now, in this particular case, believe it or not, it was me who found this cat. I was not afforded the honor of naming him, however. That honor went to the head ranger here at Juma, which I was very satisfied with because the head ranger is Aubrey and I like Aubrey very much, and Aubrey decided that his name should be Mar Maripse, which I think is great. And he's named like that because he was found so frequently um, post my finding him uh, on Torchwood on a huge slab of granite just near their camp. And that's why he was called Maripse, which means stone or stones. And interestingly, his brother, Tumba, who's uh, now six, I think, just over six, and lives down south in the Sabi Sands. Uh, Tumba means rock. <laughs> so it's really appropriate that that's what he's called. But everybody likes to get in on the naming action and everyone likes to claim that they should have the right because, you know, they think about him the most. They love leopards the most. Their lodge finds more leopards than other lodges. Their trackers are older than the, you know, it goes on and on. It's a deeply painful process. And of course, it makes absolutely no difference to Maribse, whether he's called Kenneth, Maribse, Fochabus, or um, uh, Clarissa. <laughs> I quite like his name, though. He's just having a little listen and a relax now. <coughs> Hi, 
my name is Claire. Wild Earth has been part of this home for many years as it connects us to the bush and the culture that we love and miss so much. I became an explorer so that other people around the world can get to experience the African bush in this unique way as well. I am beyond excited that I was drawn to win the prize at Amakala Game Reserve for three nights. It is truly a dream come true. Sign up today and you could be the one experiencing it for yourself. Another vehicle coming in. I think they've spotted him now. So they will use a spotlight. We don't have to do that. We have got infrared. And so we don't have to use the spotlight. And if you are a new viewer, all of the light that we are casting on him is infrared. He can't see it. And but our cameras can. Now you see that salivating. That's because he's smelt a territorial marking, I think. That's very typical. And I suspect it's his father's, or tortoise pan actually, mm, most likely his father's marking, and that's caused him, I, I suspect because he's becoming adolescent, or he is adolescent, it's creating a response in him that is, could be described as territorial. I doubt it's a female that's making him salivate like that, but it's possible. He's probably going to go down to the water and have a bit of a drink. Oh, nice question, Viv, from the UK. Uh, you're asking about Tavangumi and his territory, and Tavangumi obviously um, carry on go for it Tavangumi was a male leopard who tragically fell victim to a snare and then had to be put down for various reasons uh, up north of here and Viv's asking if his territory has been taken over and I don't know actually it's an interesting question it could still be vacant and I suppose what's interesting about that is that the it wouldn't shouldn't be vacant for long, and you know who might occupy that territory. Um, unfortunately, the territory is most of it is quite far north of us, and so you know we won't really be party to 
the territory will take over almost until it's done, I suspect. All right, so let's drift a little bit forward. I thought he would go and have a drink, but he doesn't seem too keen on the water that is now filled with buffalo poop, buffalo pee, <coughs> buffalo <coughs> skin muck, muck in general, terrapin dung, bird dung, Egyptian goose dung. There's a bit of a bank here that I'm afraid of falling down. I'm going to have to turn some lights on. Yes, that could have been dangerous. Now he's gone off into this thick stuff here. I'm not sure we'll follow him. Yeah. Let's pop up to Cedars and see. I'll try and catch up with this cat and see what he's up to. Oof, this block. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, show man. All right, well, it was still good that James had my lips for, for a while there. That's good stuff. All right, so I've just taken a look on the northwestern corner of uh, Juma, of the property. Just to see if any lines have come down. Like, you know, usually this corner with the uh, Telemati breakaways or the S8 mail, they tend to like to come into this area, this site. So, uh, but uh, no tracks of anything. Oh, we've got a little scrubby. Sorry, buddy. Jump this way. Follow the light. Follow, follow the light. And follow the light. No, no, no. Follow the light. Okay, you followed that light there. All right. Thank you. All right, so little scrubbies out the way. Sometimes the scrubbies can uh, run in front of the vehicles for kilometers. Are you Wild Earth's biggest fan? Well, we have a brand new competition for you. Join our naturalists on Safari Live and listen out for weekly questions. To enter the competition, head over to our Instagram Search hashtag Wild Earth Fan of the Month and comment your answer under the post. The monthly winner will be determined by the total quickest and most correct answers. We announce our winner at the end of every month. Tune in to Safari Live Daily.
Now, we have still got him, but it's getting very thick in here, and I don't think we're going to be able to follow him for long. What's interesting is that he's heading due west <clears throat> towards the boundary with Tortoise Pan's territory. And so I would imagine that his father has probably walked this, this game path quite frequently. But once the game path ends and we hit the thick stuff, we're going to have to leave him alone. There we are. Let's have a last look at him there. It gives you an idea of how incredibly quiet it is and how he makes no sound whatsoever. There's a big stump in front of us. Hmm. Oh, there he is. He's still in front of us. But I really think we're coming to the end of the line. This game path sort of closes in like that. Well, we might get another view of him. I haven't been through here for a while. Have you got him? Oh, there he is. Well spotted, Panda. 35 points for you. Honey Badger, you say thanks for an amazing day and week of sightings. Yeah, it's been an amazing week, actually. It really has. It's been really good. Lots of leopards. A little bit of S8. Cheetahs. Cheetahs of Damakala. Buffaloes galore. Elephants galore. But really, it's been a fantastic week. Yeah, everyone, I'm afraid. Uh, look, I'm going to try, but I think it might be the end. I keep saying that and then trying and we catch up with him. Do you go there or there? Oh, no. Did you see him? Left or right? Right. I couldn't see. I was watching the screen. I can't, wa I can't see anything when I've turned the lights off. I remember spending a long time, speaking of the ancestors, in this block while Tandi... Can you see him? Oh, yes. Well, Tandi was looking for young Tlalamba. Hmm. Marit, do you have to go in here? Easy little spot for a leopard to get through, not so much for a vehicle. Panda, this could get uncomfortable. I warn you. I warn you in advance. Mm. Do we try? Do we dare? Cedric will be displeased if he has to come and fetch us. Mm. Oh, this is going to be a close one. <laughs> it's, it's too late to back out now. Hold on tight. You're holding on. Okay, we made it. Elizabeth, you say, stay safe, sweet Marips. You love him so much. Yes, we all do, Elizabeth. Oh. oh, goodness. All right, I think he's gone off that way, and we're going to leave him because 
I do not wish to spend my weekend digging this car out of a fairly dodgy area. I think it's fairly too dodgy already. Oh my goodness. Two minutes to the end of drive, probably about four hours to the end of us getting out of this area. Mmm. Aish. <laughs> I apologize, Panda, for any injuries done to your person during the course of this extraction. Watch out. What a way to end the drive, eh? Death and destruction by Silver Cluster Leaf. Uh, <laughs> and at least you still have your fly swatter, right? Your fly swatter. Uh, road is up here somewhere. There's the road, we made it. Ah. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on our sojourn in the wilderness this afternoon. It was great fun, very calming, very pleasant, and finally ending with Marite. We will see you tomorrow at 0630. Until then, stay safe and happy wherever you happen to be on planet Earth. Bye-bye. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised.